Hi everyone. Um, I'm Arjun, and it is my pleasure to tell you about our recent work on developing a method to annotate publicly available omic samples in an automated fashion. Okay. I want to begin this talk by uh, giving you an idea about how much omics data is actually out there. The table on the right is showing you uh, human samples and data sets that come from 14 commonly used omics experiment types. And it's quite staggering to see that we have more than 1.3 million samples that are out there for any one of us to actually use. Okay. These uh, samples come from you know more than 26,000 uh, studies. And this data is incredibly valuable uh, that uh, no doubt all of you already know, right? For example, in our group, we routinely use data like this to build models about the genetic and molecular basis of complex diseases and traits. Though this data is an incredible resource, it is also unfortunate to know that this data is actually acutely underused. This is because all the scientists are keen on using these data, published data, to answer new uh, questions. It is still very hard for them to discover the specific data sets of the samples they are interested in so that they can do new analysis or reuse them in new ways. This is a significant challenge because while the sample, you know, molecular profiles are there, they are also, you know, described using in a way that is in a form of unstructured text, essentially just blocks of text that yeah, people like you and me can read and sort of understand what is going on but they are poor for, you know, computationally easily discovering data sets and samples. The other issue is that scientists also use different terms or sort of a set of non-standard terms and phrases to refer to the same biological concept or entity like a tissue or a disease. So these two problems together make it very hard for discovering the samples that one is interested in. So we, a few years ago, set out to try and address this problem on a large scale so that we can make all publicly available omics data easy to find for biomedical researchers. Uh, this project was originally started by an amazing undergraduate student, Mark Maldavar, who is now a student in the MSU Med School, and then taken over and then expanded in numerous ways by uh, an amazing graduate student, Nathaniel Hawkins, in our group. What Nat and Mark did was to come up with the following solution, which is to take the unstructured sample description that is available for samples, okay, and then use techniques from natural language processing to extract signals from these descriptions, and then use them as input to supervise machine learning algorithms, which can then help infer standardized sample annotations. This entire work is described in our recent preprint. You should go check this out if you want to learn all the details. I'm going to spend the rest of the time in this talk to give you the highlights reel of this project. Our main inspiration comes from this class of methods in natural language processing called word embedding. The idea is that you can build these sophisticated neural network models that can train on large text corpora and contain millions of pieces of text, and then learn to represent every single word using a set of numbers. So for example, if we were to apply a model like this, we use this model called Flare, and if you apply this to you know, biomedical text, we will end up with data like this, where we can take every single word and turn this into a set of numbers that essentially capture its semantic meaning. So which means that you know words like hepatocyte, aspirin, dementia, or P10 is now numbers. Okay. And that is great because numbers can be naturally used as input to a many existing statistical and machine learning methods. So this is our starting point. So the way we use this idea to do sample annotation is the following. First, we created a large gold standard where we manually looked through sample descriptions and associated them with terms, uh, uh, you know, tissue and cell type terms in the Oberon and cell type ontology. The ontology is great because it gives you some structure because it uniquely defines tissues and cell types, and it also tells you how these terms are related to each other based on anatomy, physiology, and development. Using this ontology backbone and the sample descriptions, what we did was to take these descriptions, 
and perform natural language processing in two steps. First is to do a simple pre-processing to clean up the text. And then second, after cleaning up, what we did was to create this thing called text-based sample embedding. This, what the way this works is actually quite simple. We essentially take every single word in the samples description, create a word embedding, and then average all those embeddings to create a simple, single embedding for that sample. Once we do that, we have for every sample a representation that tells you that sort of encompasses its entire description. Now this is great because these are numbers and we essentially feed them as feature vectors in a machine learning model. We trained logistic regression models for every tissue we had data for. And the model essentially says, given the sample's text embedding, the numerical representation, does it belong to a particular tissue or not? So that's the classification every model is going to make. Once these models are trained, now you can bring in any new sample along with the description, essentially try and make predictions. So the way it works is, take the description, do the same pre-processing, to get convert all the samples to uh, uh, you know uh, their text-based representations, feed them to these pre-trained models, and then get predictions. The prediction is you get one mark for every single tissue. You get a probability that a particular sample belongs to that tissue or not. So this is our entire framework, and we are going to call this NLP ML uh, to essentially mean natural language processing combined with machine learning. Okay. Now, to understand how good this model is we compared it to a really good existing method called Metasarray. Metasarray uses graph-based reasoning to do sample annotation based on the sample's text description. Okay. Here I'm showing you how well Metasarray performs using this measure called average precision. Here, the, average, the median average precision for Metasarray is about 0.5, which means that if this method gives you 100 samples related to a particular, predicts 100 samples related to a particular tissue, 50 of them are likely to be correct. I'm showing you a back plot because this is performance of metasare across a large number of tissues, and you'll see there's a plenty of variation where there are some tissues for which metasare performs really well and others not so much. So in comparison to metasare, our method, NLPML, does quite well. It's actually sub substantially and significantly better, okay, with an average precision of about 0.75, which means that getting 75 out of 100 predictions correct is actually pretty good okay now to but this comparison between nlp ml and metasarray is not that straightforward to bring home that point what i'm going to show you is a series of scatter plots okay where it is the met the performance of these two methods for a range of tissues is shown as a scatter plot every single point is a tissue and i'm going to show you four scatter plots like this this is essentially all the tissues we have data for but split into four groups based on the amount of training data and here, I want to point out to tissues on the bar in the leftmost scatter plot where we have very little training data because of which the NLP ML models, which is our models, do not perform that well many times. But the meta SRA models perform really well. Okay. So, which means that whenever we have methods that perform well in slightly different problems, the best thing to do is to combine them. And it turns out that combining these two methods gives us performance that's better than either of them. And the average precision of the combined method is actually pretty high, which is really gratifying to see because these methods only use text descriptions. Okay, now, to see if these models actually make biological sense in addition to, you know, making accurate predictions, what we did was to go back to the logistic regression models and look at the beta coefficients and take all the coefficients for all the models that we have and do dimensionality reduction. And in, the, in this plot, I'm showing you the result. Every single point corresponds to the logistic regression model for a particular tissue. And the, every single point is also colored and shaped based on the organ system the tissue belongs to. And you can immediately see that there is nice clustering where biologically related tissues end up with very similar models. And so that's a good thing. So it gives us some sense of how, the fact that these are biologically meaningful models. The another thing that we did was to see, okay, these NLP ML models work on text. So uh, see, uh, you know, uh, sample text descriptions. Our idea was to see, was it, does it work on any text to associate it with, uh, you know, tissues and cell types? So what we did was to actually apply this to descriptions of biological processes or diseases and ask if 
and the models will relate them to the most relevant tissues in a correct way okay and turns out that this is true and this is also speaks to how our NLP ML models are transferable across domains and this is going to become important uh, you know uh, in a minute the fourth point that I want to make here is that if you take omic samples there are two things that are available from it one is the description of the sample the other is the omics profile that we have right so but but both these are actually quite informative about the sample source so we wanted to see you know how well the text based models compare to models that are based on the omics profile so we did this using you know microarray samples and asking if we can classify the samples to its tissue of origin based on either the sample's text description or based on the expression profile turns out that on an average the text-based models are as good as the expression-based models so this is also a really good thing to know but again this comparison is not that straightforward and again using similar scatter plots i want to point out to cases where on i'm what the, i'm showing you on the leftmost part of this particular slide where with very little training data the expression based models are not able to do that well in many cases where the are you know natural language processing based uh, model the rather the text based model performs quite well okay. so again the it seems to be there are two different models that perform slightly differently in for different tissues so again combining them is always better than either of these models okay so to give you a summary of everything that i've told you here is meta sra performance we our models perform substantially and significantly better than Metas array. Combining these two gives us a method based on just text that's better than either of our methods. And this combined, you know, text-based method is as accurate as ones that are based on expression data. And combining everything gives us a very high average precision that becomes practically super useful. A couple of points that I want to point out about the result is the following. If you consider the expression-based models the, and then try to see, okay, how do you build this model for other types of omics data? You have to retrain these models from scratch. So for example, predicting tissue based on methylation profiles, you have to retrain new models. But our text-based models are great because text is text, right? So which means that you can take the descriptions of methylation samples or RNA-seq samples uh, or, you know, or DNA binding samples or whatever and then still get predict tissue predictions from the models that we already have. So to make sure this is actually the case, we applied the models that we have that are based on descriptions of microarray samples to classify descriptions of samples from a bunch of different omics technologies and it turns out that invariably we get very good accurate predictions. So which means that our text-based models can annotate samples from any type of omics experiment. Uh, we have released our uh, method as a software. It's called, we call it text to onto It's an available on this particular link. And it's in this uh, repository that is, has very well, a very good documentation. You should go definitely check this out. Going back to our original goal, we want to make sure that we are able to apply this to as many omics data as, uh, samples as possible. So we are continuing this work and going in many different directions. We are con continuing to improve the fundamental method itself to you know, more sophisticated uh, natural language processing uh, to see how, uh, how we can keep making improvements. We are also expanding this to other types of sample attributes like you know, phenotypes and diseases. We're gonna expand this to more species, not just humans, but also model organisms. And we are also building a web server where we're gonna store all these you know, text-based annotations so that for biologists to query and find data sets and samples that are interesting to them. So with that, I want to thank the terrific group of people that I get to work with every day. Uh, especially, uh, I want to acknowledge Nathaniel Hawkins who led this wonderful study. Our funding comes from NIGMS, NSF, and SGCI. And here is some information about uh, the preprint of the software. And I encourage you to you know, give us some feedback using this particular link. And I thank you all for listening in. I'm happy to take questions now.